In this video, we're going to be looking at the motion of a system's center of mass, not just the motion of individual objects. What are we going to do? We're going to first review the concept of a system's center of mass. We're also going to see how the system center of mass changes or moves as objects within that system individually move. We're going to apply Newton's first law of motion to the motion of the system center of mass, not just that of individual objects. We're also going to be looking at applications to this concept. Why are we doing this? Well, just like finding the system center of mass plays a key role in supplying a system into an object, finding the velocity of the system center of mass also plays a key role in describing the motion of the entire system. Because remember, it's always easier to work with one or two things, such as velocities, than to work with many. So again, we're going to simplify everything down to an average for the group, and we'll have a much easier time solving for everything as a whole. Once again, it's going to be a starting point. Once we find the group as a whole, we will then look at the individuals. But again, a great starting point is to simplify everything down to the center of mass. Also, many of our concepts, such as the Newton's laws of motion and the conservation of momentum, are actually based off of the motion of the system's center of mass, not that of individual objects. Now, if you remember, center of mass is really just the average location of where the entire mass of a system can be thought to be. So if I have a rod and I have all the individual atoms with all their individual masses, I can pretend that the all the masses are focused at their center of mass, which is normally in the center of the rod if the rod is uniform, which means it's evenly the mass is evenly distributed. If I have something that's not uniform, such as an axe where I have a light long handle and a very heavy metal head, the center of mass is often much closer to the heavier head than the, the center of a handle. Another term for center of mass was also the center of gravity, because we can now pretend that all of the gravitational force that pulls on the mass is focused at that one location where the mass is thought to be located at. Remember, the center of mass is not the middle point where all masses are equal on both sides. It's just the balance point. It's the point of where we can pretend all the mass is. It's a weighted average. When we take a look at objects that are compound or complex, we often can simplify things down from the center of mass point of view. So for example, if I look at the Jenga pile here, this is tilted. It looks like it should fall. But as long as the center of mass of this entire system is above the support block, this thing will not tip over. Now, if the center of mass moves off to the side just a little bit, this is going to fall. Or if it falls off to the side over here, it will tip off the other way. But as long as the center of mass of the system is right above this block, this system will not fall over. Here we have a person who is twirling a color guard flag and if you ever watch it from a participant point, I'm sorry, an audience point of view, the flag is twirling very quickly. There's a lot to see. It's easy to get confused on where things are going to go. And when people first start doing this, they often have a hard time catching the flag. When someone is experienced with this, they end up looking just at the center of the flag itself, because that's the center of mass of the system. As long as they keep their eye on that and they focus on the motion of that one point, they know exactly where the flag is going. And they know exactly where to catch it. Because they don't catch this normally on the very ends. They first grab it in the middle and then they grab another part. Also, when we take a look at our ax that's being thrown at a target, the ax rotates along its center of mass. Not only that, But we know that the ax is going to fall slightly because of gravity. And the center of mass actually drops slightly each and every time. It's a very small amount right now because it's a very small amount of time that the ax is traveling in this picture to hit the target. But we can actually reduce everything down to a single point that's just moving and hitting the target. We calculate the center of mass 
simply by the weighted average equation, where it's the total mass of the entire system times the average location for the entire system's mass, which will equal the summation of each individual mass times its individual location. And we can do this for the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. But if you notice, the equation literally is, again, the, the same for all three. The only thing that is quote unquote different is the variable that we're using for the coordinate. When it comes to Newton's first law of motion, most people just simply say it's an object at rest tends to stay at rest, while an object in motion tends to stay in motion. And that is a way to oversimplify uh, definition or description of the first law. Newton's first law of motion really just simply says that an object or a system's motion does not change in either speed or in their direction unless there's a net outside external force acting on that object or a system. Newton's first law was never about just objects. In fact, none of his laws are about just objects. They're actually about systems of objects. So again, if we always keep everything to the very simple definition, often the real meaning is lost and its ability to apply it goes away. Newton's first law is actually really simply stated as nothing is going to change in an object or system's motion unless there's an outside external influence causing it to change. The external influence has to be a force. Now remember when dealing with systems, objects within the system can have their individual motions change. Something can speed up moving to the right, but if someone has more motion to the right, another object will have to have less motion to the right. In fact, it might even have to have motion to the left to compensate for that change. So the total doesn't change. You can think of it almost like your grades. If you're going to have a set number average and one of your grades starts to go down, then another grade has to go up to keep the average exactly the same. And as long as that number chase stays the same, we, we act like or pretend like nothing is happening, even though in reality, there really is a lot of change. An application to this actually comes, an application of this actually we can see in rock. So when looking at the Jenga pile here, we do actually have a force of gravity that's pulling down and we have a force of the floor pushing up. And as long as they both act on the center of mass, the Jenga system does not actually tilt over. There's no reason for it to. Likewise, here we have two asteroids that are going to collide. Now, the individual motion of each asteroid is changing but one is moving to the right, the other is moving to the left, and when they collide, if they are at the appropriate speeds, they're going to stop moving. If not, then the large asteroid will push the smaller asteroid to the right, most likely, and they'll be moving as one group, but that was the motion of the entire system that was already there. We just didn't see it. The each individual asteroid here does experience its own external force from the other uh, asteroid, but those forces are all internal to the system, so there's going to be no change. Here we have a nebula that was caused by an exploding star, and we notice that all the mass separates out almost in a circular form, or spherical form really, because the overall center of mass of that system did not move because an explosion is purely an internal force for the entire system. The individual pieces within the system get pushed away, but as much as something gets pushed in one direction, something gets pushed in another. So the average location does not change. An application in rocketry that we have for this is what something known as free speed when rockets start to go through separation. Often there is an explosion between the back and front part. The force pushes on both, pieces, uh, both ends. This causes the back piece to slow down or to move backwards, and it causes the front piece to move 
forward even faster. Now the reality is the speed of the system does not change. The force of separation is an internal force and so it does not affect the center of mass's motion. However, the individuals, that motion will change. It's really hard for us to grasp because when the rocket is moving as one, we see the center of mass's motion because it, it's all one thing. We can pretend that the system is an object. But the moment they separate out, it is much harder to see what's going on with the center of mass's motion because we don't see the center of mass. No one is doing what the center of mass is now doing. Here's a type of analogy that we can use to kind of help explain what's going on with the center of mass is motion and the motion of the individuals that make up the system. So here we have two guys, Bill and Bob. They're both in the same class and they both have a goal of getting a 70 for the class. They don't want to get anything higher or lower, they just want a 70. They have one test grade that's going to be coming up and that last test grade is 35% of their grade. After this, nothing else is done. So Bill, he actually has a 70 for the class before the last test. So Bill doesn't feel a whole lot of stress because if he has a 70 average and he has one test coming up and he wants a 70 for the class, he just has to pull a 70. Basically, he's like the rocket before there's any separation. The center of mass's motion is the average for the class that he wants. It's a 70. The back end here is his test, his class grade before the last test, which is a 70. So to maintain the 70 average, he just needs a 70 on the test and everything is good for him. The Bob, however, is underneath a fair amount of stress because he only has a 60 average. So the back end of the rocket is going slower than the system. The center of mass's motion of the rocket is a 70. That's the class average that Bob needs to get, a 70. But at a 60 average, he has to do better on the test than a 70. In fact, since the test is 35% of the grade, he has to pull an 89. If this test percentage was only 15%, he'd have to score up into the 90s. And if this test was 50% of his grade, well, then all you would have to do is pull at like an 80. And so the, um, the score that Bob needs to do on this next test depends on the amount of weight it has in the entire system, the percentage of the weight that it has for the entire grade. And so here we see a great example of where the individual pieces will not actually have the motion of the system. Most of our grades are this way. However, we can easily see what the average would be. Bill's is the easiest case of all because everyone's doing the same thing. And it's always easy to understand how the average of five numbers is five when all five numbers is the number five. It's much harder to figure that out when you have five different numbers that are all range between zero and 10. Just like finding the center of mass's location, which we did through a weighted average, we can do the exact same thing with velocities. The velocity of the center of mass's system is in fact a weighted average of the individual velocities. So if we take a look at the center of mass equation, we see how it's the average location of the entire system times the total mass of the system equaling the summation of each individual location times its mass. When we do velocities for the system, it's gonna be the exact same thing. VCM is an average velocity for the system. So the velocity of the system times the total mass of the system equals the summation of the individual velocities times their masses or their weights. So it's the exact same concept. When objects collide and stick together, the final velocity as they move as one is the velocity of the system. Whenever the objects move together as one, 
we see the velocity of this system, of those objects. So here we have a collision of a 20 kilogram object moving at one meter per second to the right, five kilogram object moving at four meters per second to the left. I want to find the velocity of the system. And the picture is a little misleading because you're thinking, oh, the velocity of the system is what you get in the very end. That's not the truth. The truth is the velocity of the system is both in before and after. The velocity of the system is not changing. We just don't get to see it physically until they stick together and move as one. Please notice we have no net external forces on the system. Now we do have gravity pulling down on the blocks. Of course there would be that. But there's also a force of the floor pushing up to fight that force. So the net force acting on these guys is zero. So the first thing I'm going to do is to simply set up my equation for the velocity of center of mass. The total mass of the system is 25 kilograms. So 25 kilograms times the velocity of the system must equal 20 times its velocity, which is positive one because it's moving to the right plus the five kilograms times its velocity of negative four, because it's moving to the left. And again, everything's gonna be based on the XY coordinate system. Anything to the right is positive, anything to the left is negative. Vectors to the right are positive, vectors to the left are negative by convention. Please notice when I actually solve the velocity of the system, I come up with zero. This means when these two blocks hit, they're going to stop, just like these two Bs, when they collide. Their velocity of the system between these two Bs actually is zero. You don't see that until the Bs actually collide and stick together. Individually, I see everything moving. I just don't realize it. I just don't realize that the system itself is not moving. Here I have a 20 kilogram object that's moving to the right at a speed of four meters per second, and it collides and sticks with a five kilogram object that's moving to the left at four meters per second. What is the velocity of the two just after the collision if there are no external forces on the system? So if you notice in this one, I didn't say, hey, what's the velocity of the system? I said, what's the final velocity once they stick together? Well, that's just code. This is the velocity of the system. And it has to be, because I am told that they stick together. So I'm going to solve this exactly the exact same way I did before. So I'm going to solve this exactly the same way I did when I solved the velocity of the system in the last problem because the final velocity of the blocks was individually, once they stick together, is the velocity of the system, which throughout the entire situation never changed. Again, it was just something that was hidden because no one had it in the beginning of the motion. So here I'm going to say the velocity of the center of mass times the total mass equals the summation of each mass times their individual velocities. So 25 kilograms, the total mass of the system, times the velocity of the system as a whole equals 20 kilograms times positive four, because it's moving to the right again, plus five kilograms times negative four, because it's moving to the left. Now, please notice four and negative four, they should cancel out to zero, but the velocity of the system isn't zero. It comes out to be 2.4 meters per second to the right. I know it's to the right because the velocity I solved for mathematically came out to be a positive. Even though the fours were equal and opposite, the amount of weight here doesn't work out. The 20 kilogram object is four times more massive than the five. That means this guy has four times more influence than this one. So it's kind of like a person who's in a class where they have a test grade and a homework grade. Tests are 70% of their grade, homework is 10% of the grade. They got a hundred on the homework and a zero on the test and they're confused on whether average is in 50. Well, it's not going to be a 50 because the homeworks don't weigh as much as the tests. 
this is the type of case on where you see like in baseball, one person collides into someone else and there was so much motion that the other person had that they, after the collision, they keep on moving in the direction that um, that person who was moving initially uh, was in. In this problem, we have a 20 kilogram object that is moving at one meter per second to the right. It collides with a five kilogram object again that is moving this time eight meters per second to the left. And we want to find the velocity of the two objects again just after the collision if there is no external force on the system. Again, since they're moving as one object, the velocity final is the velocity of the system because one more time, when we are physically connected and move as one, we share the velocity of the center of mass of the system. So that's really just what we're looking for. So just like all the other problems, I'm going to set the velocity center of mass equation. The velocity of the center of mass of the system is equal to, uh, times the total mass of the entire system, which is 25 kilograms. It's going to equal each individual mass times its velocity. So 20 kilograms times positive one for the right plus five kilograms times negative eight meters per second for the left. And I can find that the velocity of the here is actually a negative 0.8 meters per second, which means it's 0.8 meters per second to the left. So in this case, you notice the five kilogram object being less massive than the 20 is actually pushing the 20 kilogram mass backward. That's because it's moving so fast. The five kilograms is moving eight times faster than the 20. Now the 20 kilogram mass has four times the weight of the five kilogram mass, but the five kilogram mass does have eight times the speed. So this is very similar to a case where we have like a bullet that hits something that's very massive. The bullet itself has a lot less mass than the boxes as we can see here, but because the bullet is moving so fast, it actually causes the box to move backwards. If we have a system that starts from rest, then we automatically know the velocity of the center of mass. The velocity of the center of mass is zero because nothing is moving in the beginning. So here I have a 20 kilogram object that's going to fire a five kilogram object. Both are initially at rest and the 20 kilogram object recoils backwards at two meters per second. And I want to find the velocity of the five kilogram object moving forward. So I'm going to still solve this exactly the same way, but since in the beginning, everyone is at rest, everyone is physically connected, the velocity of the center of mass is evident in the beginning as zero meters per second. And again, we know that because these guys are physically connected, they are moving as one, or in this case, not moving as one. So I'm gonna set up the velocity center of mass equation. So total mass times the velocity of center mass, which is zero in this case, equals 20 times negative two, since it is going backwards, plus five times V final for the five kilogram object. And we can solve for this and we see it's positive eight meters per second or eight meters per second going to the right. And this is the classic case of when we fire a cannon or something, that motion of the cannon moving backwards is known as recoil. And the reason it moves back is because the total momentum of the system is initially zero. So if the ball is going to gain a positive momentum, then the, or gain a positive motion, I should say, then the cannon needs to gain a negative motion to compensate because the absolute initial motion of the system, the total motion of the system is zero. And unless there's an external force, that zero is not going to change. So if somebody gains something in a positive fashion, someone needs to gain a negative to compensate to bring the total back to zero. The most complicated situation is when two objects that are not moving, uh, that are not moving together collide, hit and bounce off one another. If we are not initially together, we don't initially see the velocity of center of mass in the beginning, like we did in the last problem. If we don't stick together in the end, then we don't see the velocity of the system in the end either. In a situation where nothing sticks together, either in the beginning or the end, 
we never actually see what the velocity of center of mass is on a physical sense. However, it still exists and it is still going to remain constant if there is no external force acting on the system. So how would we solve something like this? Well, believe it or not, the exact same way as every other problem. I can turn around and say that I can, I can definitely turn around and say that in the beginning, I have enough information to find the velocity center of mass. So 20 plus five is 25 kilograms times the velocity center of mass I don't know equals 20 times positive five plus five times zero. The velocity of the system is positive four meters per second. That's before the collision, which is still gonna be the exact same velocity at, after the collision because there was no external force. So I can now turn around and say that positive four times 25 equals 20 times the velocity after the collision plus five times positive eight. And I can find the velocity of the 20 kilogram object after the collision. So when objects aren't initially together or don't end up together, when I have two separate objects at both beginning and after an interaction, I just have a two-step process. I'm going to find the velocity of the system first and then apply that again for finding the velocity of the individual object after the interaction. But I could also turn around and do a direct substitution. The bottom line is the velocity center of mass, whatever it is, times 25 kilograms is equal to each mass initially times its individual velocities. I'll add it up. And it also equals each mass after the collision times their individual, individual velocities after the collision. So instead of actually solving for the velocity centers of mass, I could actually just set up the second half of the equations in both cases and set them equal to each other, which I did here. So I can actually say 20 times positive five plus five times zero equals 20 times final velocity plus five times positive eight. If I do that, I come up with the exact same answer. So this means that if there is no net external force acting on the system, we can make the declarative statement that each individual mass times its individual velocities added up to all the other masses times their individual, individual velocities before an interaction must equal then the total sum of each individual mass times their individual velocities again after the interaction. Since this value of mass times velocity does not change for the entire group, we have something that's known as a conservation law. Conservation just means for the total to remain constant. In fact, later on, you will learn on how this is actually equal to the con uh, this e equation of mass times velocity is equal to something known as momentum. It's a term that you might have heard in the past where it's known as just the simple value of motion. We're not getting to this right now, just this will be something that we're looking at later on in the year. But again, like we said in the beginning, the concepts of center of mass lay down the foundation for every conservation law that we work with. So. That's gonna wrap us up here. Again, if you watch the video and you say, hey, I have a complete and total understanding of this. This looks really simple. You are really good to go. You can have a very easy time in class. If you're looking at this going, I kind of get it, but I need help. I'm not sure. That's exactly where you need to be because we're gonna work on this in class and address any problems that you might have. And if watching this, you're going, the what? That's okay too. Because again, we're going to address this in class. The purpose of these videos, again, is not to get us out of actually teaching you in class, but just to give you exposure so you are prepared to discuss what we're, what we're learning in class. You get a bit better understanding of what we're doing.